So Christmas is in the air. Beautiful decors garb our buildings, sparkling lights, deck our houses, promo sales are all around, and shopping spree is the hobby of the season. Christmas parties are celebrated. Why, even my barber sent me a Viber message. Sir, uh, December 9 po, bonus day namin. <laughs> so, there. <laughs> but wait a minute and take a pause. Is this not supposed to be the season of remembering the birth of Christ? And can we honestly say that these activities I mentioned reflect the thrust of that most humble birth of the Son of God? As usual, this December, I would like to reflect on the birth of the Messiah, but in a different direction. Christian vocabulary gives the event the term nativity, and the lesson I draw rhymes with it, humility. But it is so much more than rhyme. It is of the essence of the lesson that God designed for the incarnation, that is the event of God becoming man, it may be the most celebrated birth now, but the lesson I dare to say is lost and reversed. Maring ito ang pinagdiriwang na pagsilang kaysa sa anumang pagsilang, ngunit nawawala at nababaligtad ang aral ng pagsilang na ito. I collected a few verses, three in all, for this series, all of which use the word born for Christ. And then an explanation follows. When you and I are born, we may say that we are in a lookout for a purpose. Perhaps we have our parents' purpose and often our parents' purpose is redirected to something which may be our own purpose. But only Jesus can say that he, he was born already with a purpose at his very birth and that is why explanations immediately follow why he was born and always close to, to those explanations i am using in this series is the lesson of humility the lesson of lowliness though as usual it is easy to justify practices today with biblical passages that reverse humility I want to show from the explanations of the Word of God that every verse that I will use, and there are more than three, but I will use three, and every verse shows that there is a reason for the birth, and it is always close to the lesson of humility. And I begin with what is the most essential to his being born. And what is most essential is also the closest to the context of appeal to humility. I invite you to turn your Bibles with me to the second chapter of Philippians. Philippians chapter 2, we will read from verse 3 to verse 8. Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 to 8, and I read, Do nothing from selfish ambition or, con or conceit. But in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. That is the inspired word of God. The apostle is writing from prison, we must remember, addressing a church that he himself founded, which is the first church in Europe. And that is in itself a historical turning point in the Christianization of the world, that the missionary team of Paul was prevented. If you read Acts 16, they were looking to the direction of Asia. Instead, the Holy Spirit led them to the direction of Europe. And the first church founded was that of Philippi. And now Paul is writing to this church that he must have loved dearly. 
and there is so much to evoke joy for the Apostle Paul. In fact, the letter is full of words of joy and rejoice, but at the same time, there are elements of concern in this letter. There is tension present in the church between members. Tension in the church, that means it's an ordinary church. It is what any church on earth is, where there will be tension among members who are of various backgrounds and origins, though common in their worship of the Lord Jesus Christ, but coming from different backgrounds and of different temperaments and personalities, expect tension. What is extraordinary is how Paul addresses that problem. In this passage, he addresses this with something that we can assume is familiar to other churches as well because he quotes what many scholars believe to be a hymn. In fact, this passage is called in Latin, Carmen Christi, a hymn to Christ. So it must be a hymn that is already being sung in churches of that day. And Apostle Paul is using the lesson of this hymn in order to address this tension that is uh, pre uh, pervading in the church of Philippi. And this is rooted in the exhortation to the Philippian believers, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Now, what is that mind? The tension, in other words, for the Apostle Paul is not a problem of temperaments or differences of personality. The tension is something of a wrong direction of the mind. And what he is exhorting his readers and something that we can learn from as a church is to have the mind of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. So to neutralize that conflict, which often is revealing self-centeredness, self-priority, because Paul's exhortation is treat others more significant than yourself. And he can see that behind the tension is their preference to treat themselves as first as prior to others. And Paul is telling them that is not the mind of Christ. And you need to have the mind of Christ. And the central event that Paul focuses on that shows what that mind of Christ is, is that he was born, that is in verse 7, he was born in the likeness of men. I want to draw this message, Christ is God who became man to give a pattern of servanthood. Si Cristo ay Diyos na naging tao upang magbigay ng huwaran ng diwa ng paglilingkod. Christ is God who became man to give a pattern of servanthood. Of all the passages I have collected for this series, this is the one that is most explicit in its appeal to humility. You see this in verses 3 and 4, that there must be humility. Of course, there are many other things in the incarnation of Christ that is His alone. His virgin birth, we cannot emulate. His life of vicarious perfection on behalf of those He represented, we cannot emulate. And his atonement on the cross, that definitely is his alone because he alone is the Savior. You cannot emulate that. You cannot say, I'll try to be as virtuous as Christ was and then that will save me. That is an illusion, in fact a delusion, and that will only damn your soul. But there is something in the incarnation of Christ that we can emulate that we can follow as a pattern. And this is what Paul is saying, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. It is a mind that led him to the cross, and that should be our mind. This is true for the Philippian church, and this is true for our church. Now, that mind, I see two movements. 
The first is disclaiming his divine status in order to serve. In, hindi niya inangkin ang kanyang antas ng pagkadyos upang makapaglingkod. Disclaiming his divine status in order to serve. And the second movement is accepting a lowly condition in order to save. Tinanggap niya ang mababang kalagayan upang magligtas. Accepting a lowly condition in order to save. So you ask, what does it mean for me to follow the mind of Christ, to have that mind which is able to have the pattern of servanthood Jesus displays? Well, the first thing is disclaiming His divine status in order to serve. Now, since we are studying in our Sunday school Christological heresies, I should warn you what this does not mean. It is not saying that Jesus renounced his divine status and that therefore at a certain point in time he ceased to be God at any point in his life. There are cults who say that, there are heret heretics who say that and we reject it altogether. It is not saying also that he became less God than when he became man. And again, there are those who will use the word emptied and use it in a literal sense, even though in all New Testament, in all the New Testament, the word is always used figuratively, never literally. But there are those who will take it literally to say that Jesus emptied himself of some attributes in order to be man, so that when he was man, he was less God than he was before he became man and after his resurrection. That's that too is a heresy. It is not true. How many times have I quoted Augustine's words? Remaining what he was, he became what he was not. He did not cease to be God. He did not become less than God. He remained what he was, but the thrust of the incarnation is what he became. He became what he was not until then. And what he became was that he became man. In the words of the Apostle Paul, Paul here, in the likeness of men. And that descent from his divine status to becoming man is in itself something that should elicit profound amazement on our part. That baby on the manger that we often see in decorations and pictures and paintings, there is something that is amazing about that which has become so indifferent to many as a mere decoration, but the event itself should make us profoundly thankful that it happened. Because what happened there reveals Jesus' thinking. That should be ours. And what is that thinking? Insistence on claims of status militates against servanthood. Ang, ang pagpipilit sa inaangkin ng kanyang antas ay laban sa diwa ng paglilingkod. When you insist on your claims, perhaps your privileges, because of your status, your position, or whatever it is you have in this world, that militates against servanthood. Paul asserts the divine status of Christ in no uncertain terms. He says that Christ was in the form of God. That is not to say that Jesus only has the shape of God. Form of God is a way of saying in Greek that he has all the characteristics that make God, God. This is simply saying Christ is all that God is. And to live without any ambiguity, he further says he was in equality with God. Kapantay siya ng Diyos. You cannot use words more clear to assert that Christ is God. So that is what his status is. 
But what Paul says of the status of Jesus, the thinking of Jesus himself, or the Son of God, is that he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. He could have held on to the privileges of the status. He could have refused to give up on the glory that attends it. But the mind of the Son of God is different. He was not grasping of those privileges of real equality with God. Now, there is an implied contrast here that we may easily miss because the contrast is not named. But the contrast here is with Adam. Adam was not God. And yet you remember the temptation of the serpent, you shall be like gods. Now, don't blame Eve. Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 2, Eve was deceived. What that means is that Adam, who was present while the serpent was tempting Eve, he accepted the challenge with an open mind. In other words, Adam was in rebellion against God, even though God has given him all the privileges possible for a creature, he wanted more. And what he wanted is that, though he was not God, he wanted to be equal with God. He wanted the privileges and status of God, though he was not God. And now Paul is saying of Jesus Christ, he who was God and equal with God, he was not grasping of that status. That's the contrast. That desire of Adam to be equal with God is the cause of the fall. And his sin was imputed to all and became our original sin. And ever since that fall into sin, there is in every individual sinner that grasping hand to be like God. No, no one will say, I want to be like God. They will use different vocabulary. It may be, I want to be the best in the group. I want to be the boss. I want to be the one to be looked up to by my peers. I want others to look at me with envy and jealousy. I want them to see that I've got a big catch with my boyfriend or girlfriend or career or position. And when that spirit enters the church, the vocabulary changes quite a bit. It becomes, I have a better gift. I have a more significant ministry than others. I have a better claim to the attention of the church than others. And Paul's exhortation to that kind of spirit is like a thunderbolt. For he says, in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. And you might instinctively react but he cannot be more significant than I am. I handle this ministry. I am the husband or wife of this ranked member of the church. I have this position in the world. I have this reputation in society. How dare anyone forget my status? And how can I treat anyone more significant than I am? And Paul's answer to that in paraphrase is, Jesus could say that I am God. There you put beside that, I am boss. I am in this ministry. He had full equality with God. But his mind was such that he was not grasping. Now can you have that mind which was the mind of Christ Jesus? Where claims of status have no place because he wanted to serve. He wanted to serve the people of God. For sinners, there is no place at all for such pride and vain glory of status. I remember a few days ago, turning my mercury drug calendar from November to December, and it's only then I discovered November was supposed to be Diabetes Awareness Month. Too late for me. Imagine diabetics boasting to one another 
my sugar level is higher than yours. I've got 200 plus. Yours is just 100 plus. Can you imagine that insanity? And yet, that is what people are doing. I am more sinfully proud of what my position is and all that it claims, never mind servanthood. I'll make myself the focus of attention in my sinful pride and vanity. I will not be like the Son of God. Uh, that exactly is the pride that characterizes many. My challenge to you is let us call or let the call of service displace the pride of status. Hayaan mong ang panawagan ng paglilingkod ang magtanggal ng anumang kayabangan sa ating antas. I am not calling on anyone to renounce his status. Jesus did not have to renounce his deity. He remains God. Instead, theology uses the word conceal. He concealed his divine privileges and power so that throughout his earthly life, he was dependent upon the Holy Spirit. Whatever he did in terms of miracles, he did not do by the power of his divine privileges. He did as one dependent on the Holy Spirit. He did not cease to be God. What he did was to conceal that deity. In the language of Charles Wesley that we just sang, veiled in flesh, the Godhead see, hailed incarnate deity. That's what Jesus did. He concealed it so that those looking at him could not have mistaken him or could not have imagined him to be God. He talked like a man. He dressed like any Galilean. He probably has the accent of a Galilean, whatever that accent was. And in every way they looked at him, he was man because his divine privilege and status was concealed. And the only way people could see more than the man was by faith. When they believed in him. To conceived by an unknown woman in an obscure place. Born in a stable of animals in the manger. But this is God, the creator no less. Now among the lowly creatures he created. Not even the princess and kings of palaces. But rather of animals in a stable and during his adult life, it was one of service to people who would never be God, yet he serves them. And when you come to Christ for salvation, you leave behind any argument of your status. You cannot bring before God your works, your ceremonies, your religious position. You must come to God empty-handed with nothing to show but that you are a sinner, only because of Christ can you be saved. Let this be the day when you will come to Christ and cast on Him everything, because only He can save. And when He came, He came to be everything that man is except sin. You only come as a sinner, just like any other sinner on earth then you see your hope in Jesus Christ. When you become a follower of Christ, follow his thinking. No pride in his rightful claim of status. This is what I see in the manger birth. There were no sparkling lights, no promo sales, no expensive parties, no bonuses. This is humility in the nativity. The world is missing it every Christmas. December being the most pompous month of the year and we miss the spirit of servanthood I read this poem by Emma Lint entitled Unaware it's a long poem I'm not going to recite it but I'll give you the gist it's fiction the gist was that this obscure town heard the Lord Jesus was going to pay a visit and stay in a house 
that will show itself worthy to be visited. And so this man who was living alone wanted nothing more than for Jesus to visit him and he made himself busy on the day of the visit cleaning his house, preparing food and everything just to make sure that he will get the attention of Jesus. And then he heard a knock on the door, excited, he opened it only to see a haggard old woman asking for help. And he said, not now, man. I will help you tomorrow. I'll give you everything you need, but I have a more important visitor to entertain. So come back tomorrow. And the whole day passed, no visit from Jesus. And he was sad, he slept. And in his sleep, saw Jesus in a dream. And he asked, Lord Jesus, why did you not visit my house? And Jesus told him, but my son, I did. I knocked on your door and you sent me away. And that's how it often happens to those who are busy wanting to be the focus of attention. Perhaps they think the focus of attention by God himself and they cannot focus their attention on a servant that they need to serve. We need disclaiming our status in order to serve as Jesus did. But there's a second movement, and that is accepting a lowly condition in order to save. Tanggapin ang mababang kalagayan upang magligtas. Now, I'm not simply rewarding my first point. They go together, but they are different. Both refer to humility, but while disclaiming pertains to his divine status that requires humility, Accepting a lowly condition, theologians had to use the word humiliation. Now, I know humiliation has a different sense today of embarrassment that is not the theological meaning. In the theological meaning, it is an act of assuming a lowly condition from his divine perch of high privilege and glory, he bridged that long distance between heaven and earth in order to assume a lowly position. And I use the word accepting as it implies voluntary agreement with the Father's plan, which we call covenant, a covenant of redemption. What it tells us is that salvation results from the union God and man voluntarily assumed by Christ. Ang kaligtasan ay bunga ng pag-iisa ng Diyos at ng tao na kusang inangkin ni Kristo. It has been asked, if God simply wants to save, could He not simply decide to do so with no effort at all? Just say the word, just like He made creation, let there be uh, the let there be light, and there was light. Can he not just say, let sinners be saved, and they will be saved? Uh, that is a question that may be asked with sincerity, but also with much ignorance. It is not knowing the nature of God. Oh, God may save with a stroke of a magic wand only by compromising his divine nature. Only by compromising that he is a just God. And as a just God, he must punish sinners. And those who say, if God wants to save, he just needs to pronounce the words of salvation. And that settles it. God is going to be God and must affirm that he is a God of justice. And that is the reason why the only way for salvation to happen to sinners is for God himself in the person of his son, to assume the lowly condition of human nature. To save sinners, to retain his holiness and justice, Jesus 
assumed human nature, that is what theologians call humiliation. In the Old Testament, God and man are often put together in opposite. As God would say, I am God and not man. That is not to show that there is impossibility for God to become man. Rather, it shows the polarity between God and man that it takes such an impossible distance for God to be man but God took that impossible mission and it took humiliation. It cannot be put into words what humiliation it took for the Son of God to assume human nature. And why? Jesus himself explains in Mark 10, 45, For the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. There's your word again, to serve, but this time with a more focused attention to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Ransom in the Old Testament means the price you pay for a criminal facing the death penalty. And now Jesus is saying, I am the ransom. I am the one who, for those who will die eternally for their sins, I am the ransom. And it took such humiliation for me to leave heaven, become earth, become man on earth. That is a greater distance than for you human beings, we human beings will become a worm. It's a greater distance God took to descend from heaven to earth and become human nature. And it is instructive to remind that when Jesus said those words, I came not to be served but to serve, he was doing so in response to his disciples disputing. And what were they disputing about? Who will be second to Jesus? You know, it's like uh, when there's a chess tournament, it's almost... A given Magnus Carlsen will take first the best chess player in the world and it becomes a battle for second and this is what the disciples are doing let's give to Jesus the first but who'll be the second and that's the dispute and Jesus reveals to them how inappropriate that is that is not the mind of Christ that led him to the manger and to the cross in the world's thinking, the great men in the time of Jesus would probably be Alexander the Great. The legend of his conquest remains the story told 300 years since. And in the contemporary of Jesus, Augustus was the emperor. These are the great men. In our time, our great men may be those who are in the holes of power or in the holes of wealth like Elon Musk. And Jesus is saying, no, that's not my mind. This is not the mind of Christ that led him to the manger and to the cross. And Paul is saying to the Philippians, let this mind be in you. The U.S. Congress just expelled a congressman a Republican for lying about his credentials and right that they should. And there are people who are lying about their credentials because they're after credentials or they may not be lying but they want to make a display of their credentials. Not the mind of Christ. My final challenge is assume the lowly condition to bring the gospel to sinners or sinners to the gospel. Ang kinin mo ang mababang kalagayan upang dalhin ang ebanghelyo sa mga makasalanan o ang mga makasalanan sa ebanghelyo. Jesus became man to complete the gospel. The gospel for sinners is in who and what Christ has done. 
And my friend, if you have any other way of salvation than that who Christ is and what he has done by his death on the cross and rising from the dead, you have a gospel that will not save ultimately. The only salvation is that Christ died for sinners. He rose again as victory over sin. Come to Christ. That's the only salvation. And it takes his people to have the mind of Christ, assume the lowly, condition in order that they may be the instruments to bring the gospel to the lost. A witness of the gospel to fellow sinners of his peers. It is not sharing, but it is the humbling law that makes evangelizing so difficult. We would rather share the news of the day on politics. We would rather talk about common interests. But if you continue reading Philippians 2, this is an essential part of applying the mind of Christ to the world. For Paul comes to verse 14 and following, do all things without grumbling or disputing. But my boss... You cannot help but grumble with this kind of boss. And disputing my peers. And you can multiply reasons why you grumble in dispute. And Paul says, without grumbling or disputing, so that what? You may hold the word of light to this crooked generation. We also need to be lowly to seek sinners to bring them to the gospel. To its sound by invitation. This is what the birth of Jesus displays. So may I remind all of us what it meant for Jesus to be born in that manger. Obscurity for one who deserves to be acknowledged by all. The one who was looking from above and can see all that he has created, was conceived in a womb, grew in a way that fetuses grow, grow, born like any baby would be born, born in such a lowly fashion that Paul had to add, that he was born in the likeness of men, you probably might add, let's say born in the likeness of men, but let's make him a man in the palace. Instead, he was born in the likeness of men and became a servant and became obedient to death. And again, we might say, let him die, but let give him that death like Jose Rizal's. One to be remembered in the annals of history. Well, he will be remembered all right, but not because of a heroic death, but of the death of humiliation. Paul says, even the death of the cross. Reflecting on this passage, C.S. Lewis sees that in becoming man, Jesus or Christ as God, had to surrender, and in becoming man, he accepted humiliation. Exactly our words. So God became man to be a servant. You and I are servants of God and must serve humbly as part of our nature renewed by grace. Let that be the lesson of the manger. Why would Jesus have that mind? Because we can, never, we can never fathom that love so vast that he has for his people that he was willing to bridge that infinite distance between divine status and human servanthood. May God help us to be the servants that we should be through the love of Jesus Christ. Let us respond with this hymn.
It is love, vast as the ocean, loving kindness as the flood, when the Prince of Life, our ransom, shed for us his precious blood. That would not have happened without the mind of Christ, willing to be born in the likeness of men and a servant. Let us sing, Here is Love. Let's close in prayer. <clears throat> Our Father, we pray that you may let those words again sink in our hearts that perfect justice kissed a guilty world in love. You did so through the Son of God becoming man. And it is that act which now Paul uses to exhort the Philippians and through that exhort all the churches of all generations, including ours, to have this mind, which was also in Christ Jesus, the mind that led to the, to the manger, without the sparkling lights and expensive decors and pompous parties. He was born in a manger along with animals, a lowly birth in an obscure town. And yet, even as the world remembers or purports to remember that birth, we see so much the reverse of what humility is. Help us, Lord, to reflect that humility, the, the one born in the, in the likeness of men, had all the rights and privileges of being God in the, in the form of God equal with God. And this is meant to be a contrast with Adam who was not God and yet was grasping of that privilege of God. And that original sin has infected all of us. We are after vain glory. We are after status. We are after men and women looking up to us. And it is so militantly against the spirit of servanthood. Help us, Lord, to follow the Lord Jesus in his mind that led to the manger, the mind of humility, the mind of servanthood that will not grasp at the rights of status. Help us also to realize that he accepted a lowly condition, condition of the likeness of men, and not just man, in a palace, man as servant and who became obedient to death, not just any kind of death, but the death of the cross, all for the redemption of sinners. And we pray for those who are still in that condition outside of the redeeming grace of God that may this be the day when they will come to Christ as Redeemer. But make it a pattern to us who are now followers of Christ, that we may know and learn to accept a lowly condition in the interest of treating others more significant than ourselves. Make us servants. Make us lowly. Give us humility. The humility that Jesus Christ has given to us a perfect pattern of. And though we will never be perfect in doing it, grant that we may have the spirit of servanthood in our church. Now may the love of the Father, the grace of His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. <clears throat>